Hello, everyone. I'm Nancy Lucier from AVI SPL. Welcome back to the collaboration space, where today's topic is going to be all about a hot topic, interoperability. And to help me discuss that today, I have two special guests. First of all, I have John Bailey, who is a senior vice president here at AVI SPL. Good afternoon, John. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for joining me today. Yeah, great to be back on the podcast. Great. And uh, joining us in this discussion today also is Derek Kelly, who is the Director of Solutions here at AVISPL. Derek, how's everything in your neck of the woods? Is it a little cold there today? A little cold, a little cold got some snow, a little bit of ice, but we'll, we'll get through it. So things are, things Perfect. are good. Perfect. Well, I appreciate you both taking the time today. And I'm going to jump right in and just ask, you know, what is true interoperability? What does that really mean? We hear that word used a lot. John, let me throw it to you first. What does that mean to you? Well, I think in <clears throat> in this context of unified communications that we're, we're all talking about in hybrid meetings, right, all the time, it, it, it really means how do I connect my my system, my, my platform of choice to yours if they're not the same? How do I call you? Uh, maybe you're external to my company, <clears throat> or maybe you're using a different solution set or, or different software or tools. How do we make that call actually happen? And how do we ensure that the customer experience is, you know, as elevated as possible, let's say. Um, I'll throw in on that, you know, for 2023, I think three big themes that keep recurring when I'm meeting with customers and their business agility, uh, they are user experience and security in no specific kind of order. And we can debate which ones are more or less important, but I give them all, I give them all some serious weight. And so it's the user experience piece where I think we have the most um, opportunity with Interop to improve the the experience for end users, right? Because it's confusing, especially if I'm in the same room that I'm used to using, but the meeting works differently or I don't have access to things that I normally have access to. Um, that's not great, but we can connect the call, hopefully. <laughs> um, but is it going to be the experience that users really expect, right? And that's a challenge. Yeah, Derek, are you hearing that as well from customers that, you know, when we talk about the need for interoperability, it maybe isn't so much of a choice anymore. It's it's kind of a need. It's a need, and it's usually sometimes something that they don't immediately think of, you know. So a lot of customers, you know, think of whatever platforms that they're focused on, like we are this type of house, we have this type of kind of capabilities, but they're not necessarily thinking about, hey, people outside of my organization are going to invite me to a meeting that's on a different platform or maybe my vendors use a different platform or maybe <clears throat> maybe internally in our house you know this portion of the company uses a different platform you know so maybe the main group uses microsoft teams and marketing regularly uses zoom or something like that where it could be kind of just the, those scenarios and you have to find a way to meet together in a in, in an experience that doesn't make it very frustrating for everybody to how do i connect or i can only connect via this way or you know i can't connect via this and see the screen or anything else like that and so you generally as you know most companies are going around well, most companies now are multi-platform because they have to be um to deal with their own customers or to deal with their vendors or anything else like that um and so the need becomes you know bigger than just uh, a single meeting room or a single space or anything else like that, it becomes a workflow process and it becomes how do they do business and how do they get, you know, their accomplishments through in a way that doesn't create problems for everybody else. Yeah, and you, you mentioned a lot of different moving pieces, right? It's beyond just what's happening in my office, right? I could be talking to a customer, I could be talking to a vendor. So it sounds like maybe, you know, once we know what our goals are, some testing is a good idea as well. Yeah, testing is always going to be a, a big component of it, uh, but it's also just understanding what they're really trying to accomplish. Because there's a, you know, within our operability, there are a number of ways to get there, but it's what the experience is going to be, what the cost of that experience is going to be, et cetera. And that you have to figure out what is acceptable from that experience, because none of them are exactly <laughs> perfect. You know, there, there's always some level of compromise in an interoperability. And so what you have to kind of really work on is what do you want to get out of it and then test it, showcase it off, um, make sure it functions and works, uh, how they're expecting it. You know, for, for AVISPL, we do a lot of pre-staging our, in our offices. 
where you know we can bring customers to our spaces and they can experience it before we actually install it inside of their space you know so then they can kind of get a sense of okay if i push this button what does it do if i push that button what does it do or we can also offer proof of concept scenarios where we maybe install a smaller portion of it inside of their space and they can get a really good idea of what this looks like in situation with our teams i like that let's not deploy this in 500 meeting rooms right away Right. right. Let's deploy it in a couple, make sure it works and go from there. So, so Derek, you, you touched on a lot of some considerations and, and maybe some issues that would come up. John, what are some other obstacles that people may encounter when, when they're trying to get this true interoperability, but it, when everybody has that great experience and, and how can we help overcome them? Yeah, it's a great question. I, you know, a lot of it's in the, uh, I think some of the finer points of detail. Uh, and I'll give you an example. This is one that I, I commonly hear. Um, Let's say if we have customers that are using Microsoft Teams and they're heavy PowerPoint users, then they generally uh, gravitate to the PowerPoint Live feature uh, within Teams, which is really nice. It has a lot of advantages over just screen sharing, but PowerPoint Live doesn't work in, in most, if not all, interop situations. So <clears throat> not only do I not get the right experience, but this is not even how I'm used to working. So there are a number of things that we can do there. And I would say, you know, Probably at the end of the day, there are always going to be some minor variations or differences with the Spirit platform. So training and adoption is a big one, like really important that we educate users on what to expect and when to expect it and when things may be a little different based on, you know, what types of rooms or systems that they're connecting to. And it's funny, I was just having this conversation earlier today because I, I am a big believer that training and adoption should begin well before the deployment of the actual technology. So people have a sense of what's coming and they have a chance to get comfortable with the ideas and the changes that are coming their way before they just are, you know, land on them. Great, you know, brand new room. Derek, get on in there and present to 20 of your peers today with something you've never used before, right? It, it's, it creates a lot of anxiety for mm -hmm. people. And I think it's just, you know, kind of our own construct that we feel like training and adoption activity comes after the technology is already deployed. So we would we would seek to do that and advise customers to begin that journey early in the process. I, I like that idea because you, you mentioned, you know, it's going to stress me out if I can't go into an office and plan to do my best. Now I have to worry about how am I going to make this thing work? And this all goes to ease of use, which I think is a big topic with customers. Derek, would you kind of agree with that? Oh, completely. Uh, and, and, you know, going back to what, what John said is, you know, if it doesn't function the way that it functions on the normal meeting, so whatever the platform is and whatever way you normally function in that space, if you're on a different meeting where it functions slightly different, not only are you going to have to learn how to do that, but then on top of that, you have to figure out the buttons, what buttons do what here and there while you're trying to make your presentation, which could be a very, the presentation itself could be present, you could be stressful and anxiety inducing and everything else like that. And then you add this heightened awareness. You know, that's where a lot of the tools that we have and a lot of the structures that we have around this um, can get customers to the right spot. You know, the biggest thing about this is it, it, it requires a lot more planning than just flipping a switch. And you know, a lot of the manufacturers offer some version of interoperability as part of their platform, which could fit what the customer is trying to do, or it could completely not fit it at all. And you know, you have to kind of walk that 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 gap to try and move to what's an you know a better experience, a better ease of use on the systems themselves. You know, and that may be going to a third-party platform. And, and introducing that as the backbone for the interoperability as opposed to just manufacturer to manufacturer. There may be the best solution for ease of use might actually be introducing a, like an infrastructure piece in the background that allows for them to talk to each other in the easiest way possible. Sounds like we have a lot of expertise that we can lend to people. You know, maybe they have an idea of what they need, but if we're listening to their goals, we might have another suggestion, or as you suggested, Derek, a different solution that may not be top of mind or that can be seen to everyone using those solutions. So we talked a lot about, um, you know, what do we need to think about with interoperability? Um, John mentioned security. We all mentioned user experience. So, okay, I've got all this going on in my brain now. How do I, as the customer, get started? What are my top steps or my top considerations to get a project underway? I mean, one of the first uh, big things to figure out is what platforms do you want to make sure that we consider 
for use starting there because we you know once we know what we're up against you know in terms of these platforms because some of them talk to each other directly some of them don't and so if you're bringing three platforms to, to the to the forefront and one of them doesn't talk to the other two or one of them only talks to one but not the other one now we have to create a different plan which usually involves maybe a third party you know type scenario like like you going to somebody else to help that interoperability piece um, then the next stage of it is to what scale and how often, you know, because <clears> if this <throat> is a scenario where we're only going to maybe have a couple of meetings a month on this one platform, what we may instruct, you know, customers to look at and do is, okay, if you're only going to do this once a month and you don't want to pay a lot of money to involve this in your scenario, go this route and this will get you 85% of what your normal process is and everything else like that. The remaining part is gonna be a little bit different. We can train you on that, but this is gonna probably be your best use case. On the flip side, if you're gonna be a heavy user and you're gonna be doing 20 meetings a day where you might have to do interoperability and everything else like that across a larger global organization, that's a way different infrastructure. It's a way different process and, and everything else like that. So knowing the platforms, knowing how often you're expected to, to do this, some companies don't know that, but that's an area where, where we can then work with them and say, okay, you don't know that. Here's some ways that we can figure that information out as to how often you're going to need to utilize this stuff and what we can do. And then the next part about it from the security side of, side of it is, um, are there any security must-haves as part of your overall security plan for your organization? Because that could affect interoperability. It could affect what we can do, what pathways we can take, to provide interoperability. So if that is not at, at least in the top three, you're gonna run into potential issues where you get all the way to the almost the finish line and then the customer security team comes in and goes, excuse us, uh, we would put like the brakes to speak on. to you now. Yeah, put exactly, the brakes on. <laughs> completely. <laughs> so th those three things, if we at least start with those three things, we can get very far down the pathway and, and advise appropriately. Okay, wonderful. And John, I'm going to throw yeah. a, a question out to you. Oh, go ahead, John. Do you have anything to add? Uh, well, no. Maybe just to 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 validate what Derek just said. I mean, AVISPL has a host of planning activity services that we can provide. Those engagements with customers, like even like consulting workshops, bringing in these platform manufacturers, getting their engineering and human factor design teams involved or thinking about adoption or especially security. So Derek raised a great point. I mean, there are so many things for customers to try to think about and consider in doing these kinds of deployments. I just think we have a lot to offer and we've talked to a lot of customers that helped a lot of customers. So there are a lot of scenarios we've already seen and we do have some best practices that we can bring to the table there. So. Sounds like our experience is kind of going to pave the way for people a little bit there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, so talking about experience, mm. I'll throw this out maybe to both of you and to you, John, first. So I know that, you know, every day I've got three platforms that I use fairly regularly, right, at AVISPL. What's kind of the average number of platforms that people have and what has been the most platforms? Have, do people use more than three? Oh, I, yeah, I would say so. I Well, I for one <laughs> uh, do, and I, I know we're a little unique, but it's it's at least two, like 75, 80% of customers are supporting at least two. And sometimes it's a, a portion or a pocket within the business that's utilizing the second one. Uh, you know, sometimes it is just the product of big companies acquiring other companies and you know, you might be a, a team shop and you acquired a WebEx shop and then you got to figure out how to make all that work together. So, um, I, I mean, that's what I would, uh, that's what I would say there. Wonderful. Anything to Eric, add, Derek? What's the most you've seen? I think the most I've seen that we've had to work through is about five to six, you know, different platforms that we okay. had to figure out. And some of it became, was because of, um, you know, acquisitions throughout the years where different divisions were like listen we're not changing at all and they had no compelling reason to make them change or anything mm -hmm. else like that it's a good point it's a good point um, yeah you know if that was what their workflow was and everything mm -hmm. else like that like sometimes it doesn't make sense to just introduce a change just to introduce a change you know and you know in those cases that's where some of our other providers like pexip and everything else like that can come in to be an agnostic provider in the background that doesn't matter what the platforms are that are trying to communicate together, that they can come in and help us with the infrastructure side of it um, and, and, you know, in the background of it. So 
I think the biggest thing is, is, you know, there's a lot of options and there's a lot of different ways to do this. And if you talk to each individual manufacturer by themselves, they'll probably push you down one or two other pathways that may not be the best choice for the customer, but maybe the best choice for that platform. So that's really where our, you know, John mentioned our consulting workshops and kind of the expertise that we can take in those scenarios. We can really work with customers and go, okay, while this has this, overall, this might be the best choice for you. And that sometimes, you know, in some of the scenarios that we've, you know, worked out with customers, sometimes that's a free solution. Sometimes that's a, a solution where it's like, listen, based upon your use case and what you're trying to do, this free solution that already exists out there might be your best pathway, you know, as a whole. And we discover that during a consultancy workshop or through conversation with discovery scenarios and everything else like that. And sometimes that's the best pathway. Uh, and, and, you know, we can instruct them that like, listen, that exists. You can do this. It doesn't cost you any money. These are your limitations. And then that might be the best option. Yeah, free sounds good to me. I can <clears throat> maybe spend that money on some new furniture for my office as well for there my conference room. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever works. I mean, we're talking about interop. A lot of times we're, we're really specifically talking about video, right? Video and, and rooms. Mm -hmm. But if we think about communication channels, just think about that. Like, oh yeah, I'm also got email, at least one email platform, maybe more. I've got my cell phone going here. I've got IM and chat and text on the phone. Uh, if you work in a call center, it's probably a different platform than the video platform and your phone system might be a different platform too. So it, it is really the bigger picture of the number of different communication channels we have to interface with on a daily basis. It's just a lot, right? So yeah. the easier we can make that experience and if we could at least get video to work in a, in a consistent and positive uh, user experience kind of way, I think that's that's what we're really focused on today, right? Yeah, and you mentioned video and you also mentioned the phone. So how does voice play into this as well? Voice is an ever-changing landscape. So, I mean, you know, the, especially as more voice solutions have moved to the cloud, you know, they pick very specific protocols. Whereas before, you know, when you were in the PTSN days where you could just, you, you there was specific rules around what had to be supported from place to place to place, it really was just cost. You know, like it cost X to do this, to connect to these locations, et cetera. In the cloud days now, some of the solutions maybe don't support all the same number of audio codecs in the background. Maybe they support a specific number of things, or maybe they don't attach to the video <laughs> platform that you're using, you know, and you have to find a way to get both together because voice, adding voice to a video platform or adding video to a voice platform, sometimes they're not interoperable and we have to find a way to make them work together because you may have a specific provider of voice all across your entire organization. And then you want to add like audio dial in for calls for video calls, just in case you may have to find a way to make those interoperable with each other to provide for a good solution and a good path forward. Instead of going, oh, well, all the voice people have to join down this weird pathway that they have to enter in all these numbers and et cetera, et cetera. Versus, hey, we have a way to do it where they just have to dial a, a number. And if they click on the link on their phone, you know, like on their, their cell phone, they can just automatically be added to the call as opposed to having to remember the numbers or the passcodes or the, you know, the DTMF codes that they have to do to be able to get into things. We can create a pathway where all of that works together. The chat side of things, there's interoperability for chat now, where if if you're on one platform and you need to inter you know work with another platform on chat, you, there's a pathway for us to do that now where natively somebody can type in WebEx and it shows up in Microsoft Teams, you know, and so that <clears> type <throat> of scenario where you're just increasing the capabilities of organizations without necessarily having to force them down a singular pathway. It sounds like a lot of moving parts and a lot of things to think about. So I definitely appreciate you both sharing your insights today. Thank you so much. I think this is great information for our audience. John, thank you for taking the time today. Oh, absolutely. It's always a pleasure. Love to be on the podcast anytime, Nancy. Wonderful. I'll be calling <clears throat> back. Don't don't tempt me. Okay. And Derek, thanks again. I, I think we've chatted before in our podcast and definitely yes. appreciate you joining us today as well. well. I appreciate it. It's always nice to come back. So Wonderful. And to all our listeners out there, thank you so much for taking the time to join this edition of the Collaboration Space. Don't forget to subscribe to AVISPL Info on YouTube. And if you'd like to listen to the audio version, just search for the Collaboration Space on your favorite podcast app. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. For more information, 
visit avispl.com.